forests of Calradia. To many, a place of mystery and fear. But for the warriors of Batania, a way of life. Our food, our fortresses, our way of warfare, all drawn from the trees. The enemy's weakness is our strength. For too long, the chieftains have squabbled against each other, and in their bickering, our enemies have thrived. A great chieftain must rise up, unite the warriors of Batania, and then from the forest we shall strike. And we shall exact vengeance. Starting with those campaign bonuses, the one on top, probably one of the best faction bonuses in the game. 50% less speed penalty in forest. A little bit of sight range too. Whether you're new or not, it doesn't take long to realize when you're running around the campaign map that as soon as you hit the trees, you slow way down. Well, that forest penalty, as it's called, is cut in half with the Batanians. On top of that, there's a scouting perk that you can get on your scout that cuts it in half again. This is going to allow you to catch everything in the trees. Bandits, caravans, other armies you can always close with and destroy or hit the tree line to get away every time. It is a huge bonus in the early game. And as soon as you get the scouting perk that makes it 100%, it's game changing. This is incredibly powerful because of the fact that there's forest everywhere. All through Empire Lands, all through the north, all through Valandia. Pretty much the only areas excluded are the steppes and the desert. But everywhere else on the map and everywhere you're going to be, there's just tons of forest. So you're going to be flying around through those zones uh, while everybody else is moving slowly. Crazy, crazy powerful bonus and very unique, very thematic. You're going to love this one. The militia production as well. This is a really good bonus. If you don't know what this is, is that each fief or castle has a militia, which is just citizens army. Uh, and the higher you get your militia production up, that's more citizen militia you're going to have in the case of a siege. And look, are they the best troops? No, but the reality is in a siege, you need people to take damage and it's just they're helpful. It's It never hurts to have more and it's extremely helpful and simulation. So what you'll see is that the enemy armies to take Batanian towns, they have to put together 1,000 plus armies. Otherwise, they have a hard time because you're going to have four or 500 militia. Uh, they don't do that well in battles that you fight in, but in simulations, they tend to do a lot better. So they're hitting your keep, but it's going to take, I mean, it's no problem because you've got four or 500 militia in there wearing that number down and then you take that thousand man army down to a four or five hundred man army and now it's a lot more manageable and you're ready to take it out so it's a very very powerful trait especially if you get a governor that has other plus militia production traits that you can get this number up and i think there's buildings that increase this too so when you combine all of that together battalion towns are very good at defending themselves and they get a lot of advantage, especially again in simulation. 10% slower build rate. So instead of something take 30 days, it takes 33 days. This adds a few extra weeks to building th big things like walls. You can put an engineer in your fief that'll counter this, but honestly, this is hardly a con at all. And these are probably two of the best campaign bonuses in the game. And look at the sun rising. On the bear of Batania, the manliest stud of all, Bowman. And he's just such a badass, this guy. 
really enjoyed playing Batania, and I think you will too. I always share a build suggestion in my guides, so let's do that. Always like to show this chart that you can find on Reddit, just so you can plot your build. Remember, if you're going to want that final 275 perk, you're going to have to have at least seven attribute points. Also remember, if you don't need the 275 perk, you can get pretty high in a tree just by going five focus points. And you get to 204 with one attribute point. Now, let me show you my build. So this is my favorite Batania build. And right away, you'll see that I'm only level 21 and I haven't even maxed this stuff out. And to be honest, I don't really even need to. The extra 20% damage on the Noble Longbow is already a ton of damage. Yes, getting some more up here is great. Sometimes you don't want to do a full playthrough and you max everything out. You just want to get in and start kicking ass. This is a great build for that. Also, the build that I like is pretty much complete at this point. And then whatever you want to do from here is completely up to you. So I'll show you the build and then we'll talk about adding on other stuff at the end. Obviously starting out with that bow skill, eventually got to max it out because we're Batanians and Batanians love bows. Also in this playthrough, I did a full Fian army and who's the captain of the Fians? I am. So I'm going to want that bow skill and that two-handed tree because I'm boosting up both my damage and two-handed and the Fians bow skill and two-handed you throw this extra bow skill this extra damage this extra reload speed all on top of the best archers in the game and you will decimate all and it's just an absolute riot up here in the vigor tree you can actually make a decision and i suggest that you pick either two-handed or polearm and i'll give you the arguments for both i prefer two-handed because, again, I'm the captain of the Fians, and they use two-handed swords. So, not only am I getting to use an awesome two-handed sword, and look at my two-handed sword here. This Reaper, it's a Falx, where it's got this curved blade, and it just chops. 94 cut, 111 length, very fast. And I got it from Big Papa Kala when I joined the Batanians, so it's a little sentimental in that way. And that combination just makes it my favorite. And also, like I said, there's skills in here that increase the swing speed and skill and damage that your Fians will do. So two-handed is probably my choice. Let me show you my wife as I make the argument for polearm. She's carrying one of these Romphias. It is just incredible. It's the best anti-cavalry weapon in the game. You'll see it gets this swing attacks, can dismount riders. She just does work with this thing against enemy cavalry. The number one threat to the backbone of your army, which is your Fian archers, is cavalry getting in your lines and running through and knocking them down and lancing them. This thing will decimate cavalry. It's not as good anti-infantry, but it's still pretty great weapon. So... Depending on if you want to use a two-handed sword or a polearm, then you just make that decision. For me, I went two-handed because I'm the captain, and not only am I getting this to use this awesome Falk sword, but I'm also buffing up my Fian's capability. But if you want to do a playthrough where you're carrying that big Romphia, then do it, because you will not be disappointed. And if you add some of these bonuses on top of it, you're going to become a cavalry blender. Either of these are outstanding choices. I went two-handed. I don't regret it. A lot of fun. I think the two-handed's better for fighting infantry and in sieges, whereas in the field against cavalry, and again, most of the battles I choose to take are in the field, uh, then I think probably the ROM is a little better. But up to you. That's why we do multiple playthroughs, right? So we can try it all out. Athletics, athletics, athletics. You're used to running around in the forest. You got to have those high athletics. Also, remember, all you need is 175 skill and 200 skill here, and you get extra attribute points. So you only need to go six and six here, 
And then once you get here, you get an extra endurance attribute, which is going to give you seven. So you can get that final perk. And then up here at 200 skill, plus one control attribute right here. So you get that seven and seven just by going up to 200 skill in athletics. And the fastest way to level your athletics is to do damage on foot. And you can put out a ton of hate on foot with this bow and this two-hander. You can see, even at level 21, my athletics is climbing quickly. Also, athletics is really gonna help you in those tournaments. People don't realize that the armor reduction really helps you move around faster, helps you when you're fighting with that two-hander, weave in and out of combat so you can dodge attacks and then counter strike right here braced the reality is cavalry are going to be charging through your archer line non-stop and you reducing charge damage is really nice on top of that 30 percent reduction to all the charge damage your troops in your formation take that's a huge buff right there so you move faster right here you get a 30 percent persuasion chance which is really nice for picking up the lasses Little extra party size, a little extra damage here, reduced charge damage for you and troops in your formation, some regen and daily training, an attribute point here, an attribute point here. You're fighting with that two-handed, so sometimes using that kick is a really nice tool. Well, right here, your kick does 100% more damage. And then up here, Mighty Blow, when you finally max it out, which doesn't take too long, you stun enemies longer when they block your attack. So this is an incredibly powerful tree and I hadn't really appreciated it. But as I started building guides and leveling it more and more, it's really hard for me not to at least throw five focus points in here. Even if I only had two attribute points, I'd probably still do it because just leveling up your athletics, it helps you get through hideouts quicker, helps you get around town quicker, helps you if you ever get dehorsed and you need to get back to your guys to try to get back in the lines, helps with that. There's just a ton of great perks in here, especially if you're fighting on foot. So athletics, mwah, love them. Five points in roguery. The battalions are notorious for being raiders. I didn't hit a lot of villages, but I did hit a lot of caravans. That's where most of this comes from and selling prisoners. Already right here at 86, you can see I've already got plus 21% battle loot. I don't think you really need to level up to the end of this because already here you can see I've got 241k and I've got the best gear in the game. I mean, this is one of the best chess pieces. I've got the noble longbow. I've got stacked bodkin arrows. I mean, I have some of the best gear in the game and so do some of my companions. And I still have 241k at level 21. Zero smithing. Just from collecting battle loot. Remember, not only do you get more loot, which is more money, but the more loot you get, the more likely you are to get those pieces with those sexy attributes on them that make them fine or legendary. And then those ones sell really well. And when we looked at that attribute chart, remember, just by throwing five points in here, I'm going to get up to 200 something. It's a really nice thing to throw focus points in. And I feel like you get so many of them already. Why not? If you're going to be selling prisoners at all, this is going to level up. The more prisoners you sell, the more money you make selling prisoners, this will level up. Even if you don't hit caravans and villages. If you hit caravans and villages on top of that, it'll level up even faster. And of course, you can always do the jailbreaks if you really want to boost it up. Battle loot is the primary income in this game unless you're going maxed out smithing and you just don't even need to. I already at level 21 sometimes have to hit another city to sell all my loot. You're just, I mean, you're rolling in money as your roguery levels up. And not only that, but you get some of that pristine loot that you can throw on your guys too. I really enjoy throwing five focus points in roguery. I think it's some of the best return on investment you can get for focus points. My ultimate goal with this build is to get seven in social now, I went ahead and threw five in charm because I like the charm tree. There's great arguments for and against going in charm. I actually like it, especially if you're not going to save scum on the dialogue checks. Uh, having high charm helps a lot. 
You just get a huge increase in your ability to do things like recruit lords to your faction if you start your own kingdom. And the extra five influence per day isn't so bad. And again, since I'm already going seven in social, I thought, why not? You get so many focus points. But the real focus is right here. I want to get all the way up to ultimate leader and get more party size. So you can see my steward, the cow thief here, he's already given me plus 57 and we're leveling up his steward. We're going to get it maxed out. So I get plus 57 from him. And then I'm going to come all the way to the top of this leadership tree and get plus one above 250. So that'll be another 25 at 275. And then hell, I may just put the rest of my points in there and you can bump it up even higher. I don't know. And so the whole goal of this build is to have a massive army of battalion killers and also be a studly captain to my fians who are the backbone of that army. And then make a lot of money while we're rolling around kicking ass. And you can see at level 21, I've got everything important to me. I just, as I level, need to get this up to seven so I can get the max level traits here. But I stopped intentionally here and saved it at this point so that I could show you that after this, do what you want. I have a scout, I have a steward, I have a medic. I haven't picked up an engineer, but I could. I mean, with two points and five focus, hell, I could get up here to 200. And engineering is super easy to level. I think it's the easiest to level on the main character. And yeah, you won't have the final perk, but you don't really need it. So you could throw it in engineering. You could throw it in trade. If you want to sim a lot to get things going faster. Tactics. Hell, you're already at seven endurance. Why not come over to smithing for those of you who love it? You could throw some javelins in here. You could have both the two-handed and the pole arm, depending on which one you want. It's all up to you. You're only level 21 at this point. There's plenty of places to put them. And that's the thing. Don't ever get too stressed out about your build. If there's plenty to go around, and like I showed you on the chart, you can get pretty high up and pretty proficient in something without maxing it out. Don't let it stress you out. This is just my suggestion. But I like to buff up the Fians and then come down here and get a hell of a lot of them. Speaking of Fians, let's talk about them. You can see right here that it doesn't take much to build the best battalion armies <laughs> at all. Uh, you can just stack them full of this guy, the battalion Fian champion. Best archer in the game, and they're incredible. And they're so much fun to fight with. Build you an army full of them. All my guides are in Bannerlord difficulty, and these guys will make it feel like you're playing on easy mode. They dominate the battlefield. The only exception is you got to watch yourself because they are very vulnerable to heavy cavalry armies like those Valandian armies. Those Valandian horses get all up in your line, start lancing your guys down. They can take a few down and then the crossbowmen come in behind them while your guys are fighting the cavalry. That combo can get you in trouble quick. And Brother Bo here did a little time as a prisoner because I got a little cocky. You can see right here 260 bow skill with a bow that has 76 pierce on it. Throw on some stacked bodkin arrows, 32 per. So they have the best bow, the best arrows, and the best bow skill. They're just filling everybody up with arrows. You are always going to be able to pull the enemy to you because they're just not going to be able to sit there and withstand the fire from Vians. They're going to have to attack, which is a huge advantage in and of itself. And then they just die on the way to them, pretty much. And then the enemies who happen to live through that and cross the field and make it to your Fian line, guess what happens then? Well, then they run into the some of the best shock troops in the game. These guys have really good armor. I mean, look at that. That's 48 armor here, 50 here. They got the shoulder armor, the gloves and the boots, not so much, but the rest of it's fine. And then they've got this two-handed sword that they bust out and they get to swing in that with 220 skill and two handed. So they're the best archers in the game and some of the best shock troops and they devour infantry. Cavalry can give them some problems. However, if you pick your battles wisely, fight in the trees, get up on a hill, 
those types of things, you'll be all right. Incredible in field battles, even better in siege battles. These guys are a commander's dream. There's just no other way to say it. And an army of these will forge you a battalion empire that you've always dreamed of. You will notice that wage, 17 gold a day. So you stack a big army of these guys like I have, and you're going to pay for it. <laughs> right there, what, what am I, 2607. I don't have a fief, so there's no garrison expense. That's all army. But they kill everything, so the loot just piles up. People call it overpowered, and they're right. It's completely overpowered. It's also a ton of fun. If you're new to Batania, you have to do at least one full fee and playthrough just to get a taste for how awesome they are. If you are going to build an army full of these fee and champions, I need to mention this for new players. The way you get this noble troop line is that you need to recruit them from villages connected to castles. So villages connected to cities are going to give you the regular troop line, whereas villages connected to castles will produce some of the noble troop line. And if you don't know what villages are connected to the castle, you can always click up here and it'll tell you villages that are connected to it. So Aster and Imlag, here's Aster right over here. And then when you come into the village, you recruit troops, there they are. That's your noble troop line. These guys right here, two and three, are plenty good for looters. Even small groups of forest bandits, they're fine. If I'm going to get into larger groups of forest bandits or I'm going to start hitting sea raiders and stuff like that, I like to go ahead and take them up to hero. I mean, the truth is I take them up to fee and champion pretty quick. Once you have 20 of these guys, your early game is set. So the Fians are by far the best warriors of Batania. And they're horrific to fight against if you play against them. There's some that feel like the rest of the Batanian tree sucks. I actually think there's a couple good units in here that are pretty amazing. So let's talk about them. We'll start here with the Osworn. This is the shielded line infantry, and it's a very versatile unit. They have good armor. They have a pole arm to help fight cavalry. They got a nice shield. They've got an ax and some throwing weapons. 130 in one-handed, 130 in pole arm. This isn't a standout unit to me, but like I said, it's a versatile unit. They can handle cav, they can throw weapons, they can stand in a shield wall, and they can do it all well. I really like the Oathsworn. Good job, fella. Batania Horsemen, no. I, I did not enjoy these guys. I didn't find them to be that great on the battlefield, especially compared to other faction cavalry. I'd much rather have either some more Fians or some Falksmen or some Wildlings. I, in no way, shape, or form would I suggest such a use Batanian Horsemen. They're not horrible, and they've got an armored horse, and they've got a big spear. And they do their part, but they're not great. And compared to what some of the other units can do on the roster, I just don't have a place for them in my army. But when you're in giant armies and you pull some in, they'll do their job. And now over to the fun time. This right here is actually a decision between these two units. Remember when I told you you could either, for the build, take a two-hander or take that Ramphaya? Well, that's the choice between these two units. Do you want a group of anti-infantry blenders or do you want a group of anti-cavalry guys with the pole arm? One thing to remember is this isn't on your player character. This is on the AI. And the AI gets a little wonky with these pole arms. Yes, if you can slow the cavalry down or if they hit a tree or if you can get these guys in a square formation and the cavalry hit them and kind of get stopped, these guys will clean them off, but they're not real good at predicting incoming cavalry and knocking them off that way. It's almost like the cavalry neither need to be slowed or stopped. Every once in a while, they'll surprise you, but for the most part, I find the AI to be kind of wonky with its polearm usage. Whereas these Batania Falksmen, these guys are weed eaters. They will just whack down an infantry line with that Falk sword and in siege, if they don't get hit with ranged, which they tend to, uh, they, they, oh, these guys just mulch other infantry. And to be fair, they do pretty well against cavalry also. As long as you're fighting where the cavalry slowed down or they're on a hill or they're in a formation, 
Uh, sometimes they can block the <laughs> couch lance because that's a thing that they can do uh, with their sword. And then they get to chopping down and they do a ton of damage to the horse, ton of damage to the rider. On top of that, they just look like Braveheart badasses charging in. One of my favorite things is to have 100, 150 archers. And then behind my archers, I leave 50, 60, 70 of these guys. The enemy starts coming towards us. My archers have whittled them down. And, and then you send these guys out to charge in there and just chop them down. Feels like you've just unleashed a bunch of woad warriors on your enemies. And they just do work. And they're, they, oh, these guys are great with their Falxes. They look awesome. Uh, do remember, though, very susceptible to range, but that's what your Fians are there for. They're going to take out most of that stuff. And again, just keep them behind your line. And hell, you can even put them in a square formation so the cavalry that tries to hit your archers gets slowed down. And then these guys are sitting behind to make quick work of that cavalry coming through. So they've got some real great uses, and this is a great unit. And don't let me talk you out of using these Falksmen because these guys are... Uh, they're, they're brutal to enemy cavalry, especially if you can fight in the trees and stuff where the cavalry kind of get hung up and slow down just even a little bit. Gives these guys a lot of help. Incredible. They, they, they will take down cavalry. So these guys are better anti-infantry. These guys are better at taking down cav, in my opinion. But they're both good at doing both jobs fairly well. A lot of fun, these units. But again, they are susceptible to range fire. So just remember that. The Battalion Wildling. This guy right here, to me, is the MVP of the standard Battalion troops. He sits behind this awesome shield and tosses out these 117 pierced javelins. And then they close in and finish them off. Again, some nice armor on the head, shoulders and chest, the hands and legs. A little less to be desired, but they do have a pretty decent shield. And what's really cool about these guys, when they lean back to throw that javelin, they got that shield in front of them, so they're kind of protected. Do remember with these jav infantry, that if you put them in shield wall, a lot of them won't be able to throw their javelins because they're too tied up. It's actually better to spread them out, let them throw those javelins, and then charge them in. Uh, so I don't really do a lot of shield wall with the battalions because you can just put your fians and they have better range than I think every archer in the game and they're way more accurate than every other archer in the game. So you're going to win the skirmish phase every time. And then once the enemy infantry starts to advance, that's when I just send my infantry in. And these guys with these javelins throwing into guys that have already been peppered with arrows from your fians, uh, it is just destruction and mayhem and they are nasty with these javelins and i'll tell you where else they're really nasty with these is in sieges they break down the gate and all those guys are trapped in that little area these guys are throwing those javelins over the top i've seen them put in work with these javelins during a siege so these guys are lethal 117 pierce on the javelin coupled with 130 throwing on the wildling and you're in for a good time if you're wanting to get away from a full fee and playthrough because it's just a little too easy or whatever, and you're looking to do more of a combined forces army, a great way to do it is to get enough of these wildlings to form a shield wall when you need it. And, and, and something that your Falksmen or veteran Falksmen can hide behind. And then when it's time to engage, spread them out. So these guys can throw their weapons and just charge them in. These guys will be throwing their javelins. These guys will be swinging their falcs, and they will make quick work of what's ever left on the battlefield. I can promise you that. And here's the mounted skirmisher. One of the things you got to respect about the mounted skirmisher is he has that 150 throwing. However, they only get one bag of javelins. They basically become melee cav after they throw a few of these javelins. What's the stack? Five of them. They're not bad. They do pretty well with that high throwing, but they're not great either. And once they're out of javelins, they get really unimpressive. Where they're really shine actually is if you dismount them and put them in shield wall <laughs> or add them to your shield wall. With that 150 throwing in those javelins, they, they put it in the work and they got 131 handed and stuff. So they're really good infantry. 
But as a cavalry unit, once their javelins are out, pretty meh. The cavalry units for Batania are both pretty meh to me, but that's the way it's supposed to be. And you most certainly will not be disappointed with the Wildlings and Falksmen and Veteran Falksmen. These three right here are incredible. And the Oathsworn does his job. Obviously, the Fian is the backbone of the Batanian army, but the rest of these troops, especially these fellows right here, are a lot of fun to use, and you'll really enjoy them. Let's talk about some gameplay tips here. First, I want to show off the forest movement speed. So if I highlight the party speed icon down here, I get a list of things impacting my party speed. You see where it says forest right there? It says minus 0.59. It's already cut in half because right below it, you can see I get the cultural bonus plus 0.59. So when I'm in the forest, I get that cultural bonus. And then when I come out, it's gone. Back in, there it is again. So for my party, the penalty for moving through the forest is completely removed. By selecting the Batania faction, you get a 50% reduction you'll get the other 50% reduction by having your scout spec into this forest can ability. So the Batania cultural trait is 50%, and then this forest can is another 50%, which completely removes the penalty for moving through the forest for your Batanian armies, as long as they're composed of 75% or more of infantry units, which is everything that's not mounted. If I come into my party here and I remove my scout. Now I no longer have that forest can perk. You'll see I have a negative 1.18 forest penalty. Still have my cultural bonus, so it's cut in half, but it's not completely gone. But you put a scout that has that forest can ability. There it is. Minus 0.59 plus 0.59. 100% reduction. Remember when it comes to your party movement speed, I should definitely mention this if you're new to the game. One of the things you can do is you can fill your army up with these what are called riding horses. And right here, you'll see use for increasing speed. And you'll see the bonus I get, footmen on horses. Pretty much you're going to be faster than everybody everywhere, but particularly in the forest. And then of course, you want to carry some uh, horses right here for, for increasing how much stuff you can carry. And you can just loot these. As you take down caravans and stuff like that, you're going to get a ton of them. So you'll fill up on horses pretty quick. And then what's really nice is, because I only need the riding horses for my army, any war horses or noble horses I get, and as your roguery goes up, you'll get a lot of them. You make a ton of money off horses. And just take a look at all the trees everywhere, right? This is all forested area, and it's yours to rule, my friend. So get your guys on horses, get a scout with the forest can perk, and drive your opponents into the tree line and take them down. Caravans, armies, whatever, the forest is yours. Now, when it comes to battles, there's nothing easier. All we do, we come in, we spread the boys out, and we're ready to go. Get them on our six, then we locate, close with, and destroy. And it's as simple as that. Now, as we're on our morning stroll to the enemy here, let's do talk about one factor that can come into play in your battles, and that's weather. Remember, if it's raining or snowing, reduced accuracy and damage from ranged units. It's not as bad as it sounds, though, because it also reduces the range and accuracy of their ranged units, and the mud and snow dramatically slows down the top speed of cavalry, so they can pretty much just prance at best. And because I have the best archers in the game, and I've got a full fucking army of them, it doesn't really hinder us that much. So don't be afraid to fight in the rain or snow, but do be aware of that if you're going up against huge armies. Uh, and just, you know, it's most ideal to get a beautiful sunny day like this to harvest. That's what we're about to do. Now, when it comes to the trees, it's really nice to have some in your ranks because 
the cavalrymen run into them. They get stopped. And the second they get stopped, they get filled up full of arrows. If they're running full speed, they're getting that charge damage. They're bouncing our boys. So we're going to go ahead and get right here. And, oh, they're actually coming in kind of bold. That's kind of nice. I like that. I like to see that from the AI. But they're really going to regret it. And see, look at this sword I've got. Look at this cleaver. Big Daddy Caladog gave me this. And this is why I love him. Gave me this sword. Gave me his daughter. Where's she at? Right here. Look at her. Love you, sweetheart. She's a murder machine, dude. I got to be real nice to her. And, uh... So you can see, they just make, look at that. We're just shooting those damn pony boys down. And if you can't hit the, oh geez, come on. I'm trying to film here, big guy. You're making me look bad. If you can't hit the rider, hit the pony and shoot them right in the head, especially once you get those uh, extra bonuses. Here come the uh, Valandian crossbow sharpshooter guys you got to be careful of them they can hurt you but they don't have the rate of fire we have so we're really going to burn them down but this is where you can get in trouble when they send in the cavalry and they get in your lines and then the infantry follow them this is actually pretty good tactics by the ai but you can see where the uh trees can come in handy here it's better if we're up on a hill but we're not and it really doesn't matter so now the infantry get here and what did i tell you they get to come into the best shock troops in the game. We don't need the bows. We don't need the bows, boys. There we go. We just chop them down. Pieces of shit. <laughs> I fucking love this faction. Look at him. Hitting that horse. There you go, that tree. Pony rides over. Look at that. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Overpowered, yes. Awesome, yes. And now you have been trained in the ways of Batania by Bowman the Bear. Attack from the trees, in the trees, with the trees, and burn your enemies to the ground. You are going to build a badass Batanian Empire on the bows of these Fians. And most importantly, you're going to have an absolute blast. Get to it, family. Oklahoma out.